Okay, so my name is Ralph Philipp Weimann. I'm from the University of Luxembourg. And I've spent the, uh, I think the last eight or 10 months basically looking into um, security of cell phones. I'll start with uh, basics, um, like what a modern smartphone looks like, because that's the target I've been, um, that I've chosen. I will talk about um, a, a topic that has been neglected thus far in this area, namely baseband security, or rather baseband insecurity. I'll tell you how to find bugs, I, well, how I found bugs. This may work or not, may not work for you. In this, in this software, I'll talk about the practicality of exploitation and uh, what this implies for, for everyone who uh, has any connection to, to mobile phones. And I'll uh, give an overview of uh, the current status of disclosures and uh, where we're headed in the, in the next couple of years, I think. Okay, so let's start. Uh, while I'm talking, I'll try to to build up uh, the demo setup as well. So because I, I have a demo for um, the uh, vulnerability that was recently fixed by Apple this week, which was a heap overflow in the baseband that I reported. Um, but um, because uh, my USRP was slightly broken uh, in the last, apparently in the last couple of weeks already, but uh, it has reappeared this problem, I have to I had to switch to, to a different USRP. So this means I can't attack the shiny new iPhone 4 for clocking problems can only do the old one because uh, the, the clock stability um, doesn't allow me to, to do that. It doesn't lock onto the, the carrier of, of this particular USRP. Okay, let's have a look at um, a typical setup where I've abstracted everything away uh, for you that is not necessary in this talk. So what we'll be talking about here is We'll be mostly talking about the space transceiver station, which is under our control because we carry it around, and about the mobile station, which will be attacked by us. Um, this is like the typical scenario you have in a cell phone network as well, but you, you have all of this backend stuff there as well, which is like the base um, controllers, uh, the base station controllers, uh, the HLRs and the VLRs and links to that. We don't care about that. Because for now, we're trying to be a rogue base station and we're impersonating an operator. So the interface between the, uh, the base transceiver station and the, the mobile station is called the UM interface or in lay speak, uh, the air interface. So when you have a look at this um, uh, interface, you, you'll see in most of the literature that it is composed of three layers. Uh, layer one to three, they are called, simply. Um, it's not the standard OSI, it's, it's somewhat different. So in layer one, you have the physical layer, which is basically um, how things are transmitted over the air. This is usually done by a DSP in the smartphone, uh, decoding and encoding into this. Then you have the layer two, which is uh, basically derived from the ISDN LAPD, um, uh, LAPD protocol, but in this case it's the LAPD mobile protocol, so they have a couple of additions and uh, some things were removed. I mean, for instance, in, in ISDN, you don't have, uh, uh, you don't have uh, collisions on a channel. Like this doesn't happen, well, it might happen on an air interface. Um, and this layer three is what we will concern ourselves mostly with because um, this is where the interesting stuff happens, as we'll see later. And this can be subdivided into three other layers, namely the radio resource, the mobility management, and the connection management. So maybe I should like answer the question first, why smartphones? I mean, there are many other phones. I mean, there are, how many, okay, different question. How many of you have a smartphone in this room? Okay, now, um, don't be ashamed. How many of you have used a regular feature phone, like a like dumb phone? Okay. Okay. So, yeah, so 
as you see here, like the, the feature phones were somewhat in the minority. Um, and this is because of several things. So um, first of all, I think because this is like a kind of technical audience, so it's more likely that uh, you guys have smartphones. Um, also because you're sitting in this talk. <laughs> That's skewing the, the bias here. But um, basically, in, in the late 20th century, um, what we saw was that um, these little devices called personal digital assistants, they merged with cellular phones. And this is what became the smartphone. Now, um, there may be many, many more feature phones than smartphones, but usually attacking the guys or girls who carry the smartphones makes for much better value. Because, I mean, what do you want with a, with a phone that has like $5 of credit? I mean, that's, that's ridiculous. And the conversations that you will listen to if you tap that are probably pretty boring as well most of the time. Um, so that's, I mean, that's why I chose, um, that was one of the first reasons why I chose smartphones. But the other reason is there's less variety as well. Like with feature phones, like you have a huge variety both in, in, in the firmwares and in the, in the models. Um, so smartphones basically have driven PDAs into extinction. Um, how many of you, of you still have a regular PDA that they use? Okay. Okay. You have a calculator as well, right? <laughs> okay, abacus. <laughs> okay. And the interesting thing uh, is that I didn't know this two years ago, that um, smartphones are a multi-CPU architecture. So... Um, there, is, there are at least two CPUs in most of these smartphones, namely an application processor and a baseband processor. And in 99% of, of all cases, ARM CPUs are used for both. The exception here is um, Freescale. So there are um, uh, CPUs by Freescale which are um, armless, so not legless, armless, no. Um, they, um, they just operate um, layer one to three on a DSP. And uh, the trend is that um, the designs are going to a single chip solution, so um, the, the, the application and the baseband processor are merged into a single package. Now this is interesting for several reasons, because um, here you see the, the two dominant smartphone architectures. So the, the left-hand side is what's used in iPhones and in, in other, like I think in, in the Samsung Galaxy um, i9000 as well. And, um, but this is like the more, more costly solution because you have a separate um, CPU for the application and separate for the, for the baseband processor. Now they um, talk to different RAMs as well, so you have another component that you have to duplicate and then you have like shared memory or sometimes uh, serial communication over some GPIO lines between the two. The other side is um, what you see in, in most of the Android phones that are based on, on Qualcomm chipsets, um, namely that you have an application processor and a digital basement processor that for cost reasons um, access the same um, RAM. Now, uh, back in the days, like, 10, 15 years ago, uh, carriers uh, thought, well, the user shouldn't like really get to, 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 to mess with this radio layer, right? So um, his, this is why historically the, the baseband processor in this uh, design becomes the master. Um, this is apparently changing at the moment because of, uh, oops, new email, um, because of um, these recent results, but at the moment, uh, everything I've seen where this architecture on the right hand side was employed had the baseband as a master. But now here's a problem. Uh, when I spoke to um, this anonymous engineer, we'll call him for now, two years ago, who told me about this multi CPU architecture, I suddenly realized nobody had looked at, this, at, the, at the baseband side and, and found, like, I, I hadn't, hadn't seen any, any published vulnerabilities in that yet. And, uh, I knew several people who, who, who were doing uh, um, reversing of these 
firmers, and I knew several people who were pretty good at security, and none of them had heard about it, I, like had heard about security vulnerabilities there, and uh, then I forgot about it, and uh, well, this year I, I started looking at it again. But um, before you do something like this, you, you got to do some market research, right? So you, I mean, you got to know who you attack. So um, the market research I did last year was I'm not sure how good this is. Um, so these were the, the, the shipment shares for the third quarter of 2009. So this is like the overall shipment share. This is not for smartphones, this is for all of the phones. And um, you see that um, Qualcomm and MediaTek are the, the two big plays together with Texas Instruments. And uh, ST Ericsson and Infineon are good as well. Now, as I said before, I care about smartphones, so I looked at what is dominant in smartphones and it was like Qualcomm and Infineon because like Infineon is all of the iPhones and Qualcomm is in, in, in all of the, the, uh, the, basically all of the HTC phones and like most of the Androids are, are Qualcomm based. Um, I later looked at MediaTek as well. I will not talk about this in this talk, but it's actually much like, from what I found, it was worse. I haven't finished that part yet. So let's talk about security of these, uh, these, the software. So it turns out that the, uh, the code base for these things was created in the 90s. I mean, that's kind of obvious because that's like, uh, when was the standard written in, in the late 80s? So, um, but the problem is like, um, it also, the, the, the this 90, 90 attitudes towards security is permitted in the code. And, uh, there are fundamental um, flaws in how um, people treat inputs that comes in over the air interface because um, it's basically, it's trusted, right? I mean, if somebody has a, a damn base transceiver station, he must have had a lot of money and hence, uh, yeah, we should trust him. So it apparently didn't occur to the people at the time that uh, one day people would be able to to buy or build base stations on a cheap for this technology. So I mean, yeah, I mean, 10, 15 years ago, you'd have to spend a, like, a substantial amount of money to build your own, uh, um, to build your own BTS. And I think at the moment, the, the cheapest that you could buy is like a, the cheapest commercial one that you could buy that is not like a, a nano BTS, is like a Huawei for, I've heard uh, figures around 50,000 for, for carriers, US dollars. But um, as we'll see later, there are other options that you've probably seen here already. Now the problem is if you trust these things that come in over the air, there are many, many length fields because these guys apparently were greatly inspired by ASN1. And uh, there are almost no exploit mitigations. Um, I say almost because um, this thing here in the baseband has one. Um, there may be others, um, but as I said, I've just looked at, uh, this talk is just about Qualcomm and Infineon firms, firmers for now. And uh, like in, in the iPhone 4, they have enabled uh, DEP on the baseband CPU. The, how they did that is kind of funny as well because it's, it's not really an ARM feature that they use, but it's like a crossbar that's like in front of the CPU core and not in the actual CPU core. And uh, you can only, like this is enabled at boot time and you cannot reset it once uh, the CPU is running un 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 uh, until the next reset signal comes. But there are ways around this. So you probably forgot what the stack looks like, but this is important, so we'll have a look at it again. So this was a stack and now we'll have a look at where we should dig deeper. So when you look at the standards, you realize, uh, well, I think there's not much in layer one that you can really do. Um, layer two messages are too short. You can crash a couple of things there, but um, you want to have like a payload to do malicious things as well. So um, we go layer up and we look at layer three, and this is specified in GSM 408. And here you have variable length messages, great. Um, so they can be either tagged or non-tagged. And uh, you have a maximum length of 250 
five bytes because they encode that in one octet, the length. However, they also use um, real ASN1. I mean, this is like TL, this TLV format is like, you see people ha have done too much ASN1 and had too much, uh, well, I'm not sure how to phrase this politely, but the, the, too much brain damage has been done by ASN1 to these people who d designed this. Um, but um, there's plain ASN1 as well, for, for instance, for this RLP, um, which um, Harald uh, demonstrated in one of his talks at the Congress. No, sorry, at, this was at Har, right? Where you've demonstrated for the first time that this can be used for querying the location. Yes, sorry. And um, in some of the stacks, you find problems with uh, parsing these messages as well. And uh, it turns out that the GRS, GPRS um, layer is very, very fruitful. But for me, there's a problem here because I can't speak uh, the GPRS um, layer yet with the, with the open BTS because it needs a different layer one. So the layer one implementation is somewhat different. And um, uh, according to people who have written open BTS, this is like one man year of effort to write this uh, for, for GPRS. Okay, so this is where things got interesting and these were my initial targets. So I started with a stack of iPhones and an HTC Dream <coughs> because that's just what, what, was, what, what was current at the time for me in terms of cell phones. And um, I started with what most people do. Uh, actually, like at the time, fuzzing was a big thing. So people told me, hey, you can like, you can totally chill and, and, and find bugs at the same time. Turns out this is not true with baseband firmware because, well, they just crash and you don't get any, any, any information, any easy information usually. So you have problems to triage the crashes. You have lots of crashes, but you don't know which ones are basically the same. And um, it's kind of like stumbling through a back alley blind. So the alternative, of course, is to do static analysis. But the problem is, uh, yeah, well, there's no source code um, publicly available. But um, a couple of years ago, um, there was uh, a phone called Vitel TSM30 by an Italian company that went belly up. And uh, the source code for this, um, at some point, appeared on a SourceForge page for a number of years and was downloaded by many, many people. And if you ask around, you probably can get a copy of this still. And this is very useful to find out what the general, like what, what, what the general architecture of these things is. Because before that, I didn't have a clue. I mean, um, I, I had some ideas what you, what what people could potentially do, but um, these were solidified by looking at the source and refuted in some other cases. So the conclusion was like, okay, we have to reverse bin binaries here. That's okay. I like reversing. So, how do we start? Um, most of the, the firmware updates that you download for smartphones already contain uh, baseband firmware as well because um, the, the uh, smartphone vendor, at the same time that he patches things in the operating system, patches a couple things here and there in the radio um, stack. But they usually are packed multiple times and you need to figure out uh, like how to extract them. So for for the iPhone, there are tools to do that because um, people have done, invested a lot of effort into unlocking these phones. And similarly for, um, for HTC phones, there's a, this community called XDA developers and they know all about ripping apart and uh, building uh, new, new Windows mobile images. And some of that transfers over to, uh, to, to Android as well. Uh, but you, you, you find that um, the, the Qualcomm firmware that you usually find in a radio image for, 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 an, for an Android, they're usually just ELF files with the loader in front of it. And um, you can, if you know the right offsets, you can straightly load this into IDA and you have a good starting point. Sometimes even people leave symbols in these, which is very nice. Um, for Infineon, you need a custom loader and relocator. This is uh, somewhat yucky. It's easier on the, uh, on the, the, on the, on the first generation things because there's lots of information available, 
on the iPhone 4, you have to really read uh, the, the um, what's it called? I think ebl.fls to see how relocation is done if you want to do this statically. But the other thing that you can do is um, people use all of these bugs to unlock the phones, to do the soft unlocks these days. And you could, can use the same path to inject your own code into the baseband through a, a bug in the AT command parser. And hence, you can gain information about uh, the MMU configuration, for instance, or you can dump regions of memory. This is uh, very nice, but probably shouldn't start with that initially. It's, it's nice when you get stuck later. Okay, now you have like this huge binary um, at the right address in your IDA, but you still don't know what's, what's what, right? So um, there's this company in Bochum that uh, is run by Halo Flake. They make uh, a great tool called Bindiv, and this can be used for symbol porting. So what you can do is you start out with a, with a, with a guess of what compiler was used, and you take the runtime of that compiler, and then uh, you, you load that into IDA, and then you take the image of, the firmware image of um, the phone that you're looking at, and then you say, okay, port symbols, and it gives you an indication of how uh, likely, by, by looking at the call graph, how, how similar the call graph for, for certain functions is. And if you like have 99% match, well, that's probably the same thing. You look at the assembly again and you verify this for you, and then you, you figure out, for instance, where mem copy is or where, where string copy is or sprintf or all of these things. And then you have something to go on. So you can go from, from the inside to the outside of the function. Also, you can, uh, if you have a Binavi license, you can identify functions that do memory transfer. Not now. Sorry. Um, you can identify functions that do memory transfers by looking at the intermediate, um, uh, they have like an intermediate language called Rail. And um, for this, uh, you can, there are analysis tools that um, can output you all of the functions that actually um, do memory to memory transfers. But it gets better because um, when you look at these firmwares, um, you see there are a lot of strings there and for some reason some of them have like, they have source file names in them and then you look at where they reference from and then you realize, oh, it's, uh, it's an assertion because somebody, uh, uh, somebody, uh, ran into an error case and uh, he now wants to log an assertion in, 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 the, in, the, in the debug, but this went into production. Um, the other thing is oftentimes you have very clean cut regions in the firmware for different things. So for, you know, for instance, um, that hex thousand to hex 5,000 is, uh, is uh, the, uh, the RR layer, so this is much too small, but then you have another region adjacent to that, which is the mobility management, and then somewhere else is the AT command parser. So it's not all over, but once you have identified one function of a certain type, you can be sure that there's um, similar functionality in the, in the same region. And uh, one tool that I've only recently uh, come to value because I, I didn't have access to it because I thought it was too, too expensive was uh, the RMD compiler, but boy, it's worth the money. I mean, uh, if, you, if you do this uh, for real, you should like, invest into that because like, it, it saves you, un like, un unless you pay like $5 an hour, uh, that's the way to go because uh, you, you get a quick overview of what functions do very quickly. And I can show you like one of these, if either is open somewhere. Uh, this shouldn't be like a product demo for Ilfak or something. But um, so this is like the nucleus error handler in, uh, in the iPhone. I think it's like, the f yeah, so the, 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 the iPhone 2G is this. So the other thing is um, don't get too ambitious. Don't start with the biggest firmware you can find. Um, this is like the smallest one. And you can usually port the results to the newer ones. Um, so here you see uh, an error handle that is basically used all over the place. Uh, I don't see how many times, but okay, you get, you kind of get the impression. And then you see, 
um, all of these nice switch statements, which you can read. I mean, you can read the same in a assembly as well. But it gets kind of painful. And with, uh, with when you do this with Binavi, you need a really big screen to see the graph correctly. Not sure what I can see. As I think the screen is too small here to do this. Um, now switch back to Keynote. Okay. Um, okay, so that's the first step. But then you figure out, wait, um, this all looks like very much um, independent of each other. And then you see, oh, it's just different tasks that communicate with each, with each other because like, they run a real-time operating system and different parts of the stack are different tasks usually. Um, so you have the problem that you need to identify these um, different tasks. And again, the assertions and logging functions are very helpful. Um, so, oops. So after several bugs were found, um, I went back to the standards and looked for more. So what kind of bugs can you find in these things at the moment? Um, there are many, many unchecked memory copies. And these are easily found once you've identified a mem copy. There are lots of uh, structure or object. I'm not sure whether it's a structure or an object. I think it's actually a structure because I haven't seen much C++ in these things. Um, issues where things are, basically, GSM has a lot of state machines, right? So um, in some of those, you can actually jump into states that are not meant, like you, you can arrive in a state that you're not, not meant to be in, and hence uh, a function will access a structure that has not been properly initialized or that has been uh, deallocated already. Um, so this is great fun as well, but it's somewhat more difficult to exploit than the first kind. So this leads like, to use after freeze uninitialized variables on the stack. And uh, well, I mean, infinite loops are kind of pointless, but uh, yeah. The other thing it's, uh, that it, the other interesting thing that it can lead to is it can lead to info leaks. So you can uh, sometimes get portions of the memory read out over the air that way. Um, this can be interesting um, when you try to fingerprint um, stacks or when you want to like read out certain regions of memory um, because you want to have a, a cross um, phone exploit that works on say all uh, all phones that have a certain stack. There are protocol, um, I call them protocol foobars. So these are um, basically code paths um, that should be only for, well, that was my initial understanding. Um, but maybe I'm wrong here. Um, code paths that are only for UMTS or CDMA, but that can be triggered using GSM frames as well. I've later been told that this is for compatibility reasons. Um, uh, this is yet to clarify. And uh, one of these examples I'll give on one of the next slides. I'll start with, uh, with one bug that is fixed now, uh, that was fixed this week in the iOS 421 firmware. So there's this TIMSY reallocation. Uh, TIMSY is a temporary um, mobile subscriber identity. Now this is for pseudonymity, basically. So um, you have the IMSI, in which basically ties your, your SIM card to your identity. I think we had a philosophical discussion about that yesterday. And then um, they wanted to be able to disguise from attackers uh, who cannot decrypt um, who don't have the capabilities that Karsten has, um, who is really registering when he goes through different cells. So um, initially, of course, you have to have an exchange with the IMSI, but when you then uh, roam through, like walk through the different cells, you um, shouldn't be able to, to trace that person unless you're the operator or law enforcement agency. So they use this TIMSI. This is like a 32-bit value, always, always, always. But for some reason, 
they, uh, they have prepended a length field to that. I don't know why. And uh, it turns out that some people actually look at that length field and say, hey, yeah, sure, we should trust that and copy that into that buffer that our colleague set up with th just 32 bits of, of space for the TIMSY. And this results in a heap overflow in this stack and on other stacks as well. It's somewhat tricky to exploit this in a stable way um, because, yeah, I think mostly because I'm lacking a debugger at the moment, like a decent debugger. Uh, also, the older iPhones uh, have a nucleus um, real-time operating system and then the newer ones have switched to ThreadX. So this means that you have a different, slightly different heap implementation, um, which is annoying. But I mean, it just need, it means that you have to write two different exploits. Okay. 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 So I think, oh, well, I'll speed up a little bit. Um, so. There's another example in the, in the Qualcomm code base, which is of a similar quality. Again, a length field that is um, for a fixed length thing, namely uh, a, a challenge response um, authentication is used in uh, UMTS. Um, this is called the auto and challenge, not the RAND that you know from, from, uh, from GSM, but um, it's a new thing. And uh, also it always is 128 bits. Again, there's a length field. And on Qualcomm stacks, this allows you to overwrite um, the stack. And uh, this is actually easier to exploit than the, the bug in the Infineon stacks. And again, just as the other one, this allows you to have remote code execution on the baseband processor before any authentication has happened. And this has been, uh, been uh, fixed by Qualcomm, as I understand it. Um, and it has been pushed to the OEMs, OEMs but I haven't seen any, um, any images that have been distributed to the customers yet that actually fixed this. And the scary thing about this is that it's like, this is, I think, less than 100 bytes. If I'm not uh, mistaken, it's like a, a 73 byte layer three message that you can send over the air and uh, you have code execution and I'll show you what you can do with that. Um, I think I should skip through this because what can we do that's interesting? So we don't want to do much work because we already spent a lot of time reversing. So um, there is, a, 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 I always surprised when I found this, like I've seen this in, in the days of when I used a modem. So there used to be this highest command set for modems and there's a, a, a thing, uh, 80 uh, plus a zero, equals the number of rings for turning on auto answer. And this is present in some stacks, notably in Infineon and Qualcomm. You can enable and disable this on um, iPhones using this combination, which is not documented. But the thing is, there's code there to turn this on, right? So it just, if you jump into this routine uh, that does in this, into this handler for this AT command with the R0 register set to the number of rings, then you've turned it on. Now, in Infineon stacks, doesn't matter what you do thereafter, you can just like crash the baseband because it's written to NVRAM. In Qualcomm stacks, you have to make sure that you actually like progress in the logical ex execution because it's, it's just in RAM. So if you crash, it's gone, like, doesn't come back. And this is like an excellent target to demonstrate many of these memory corruptions. And um, with little more work, um, you can also make the order answer invisible by basically making sure that the ring is never reaching the other side. So uh, there's uh, like a, a, a ring that is uh, basically a, a ring string that is sent to the application processor if it's uh, like this text-based communication. And um, if you just suppress this, then nobody will know and the, the phone will just pick up. Practicality. So, new base stations were expensive. Okay, so the cheapest actually was 25, not 50K. But old gear is often sold on eBay. And hardware has become cheap. Uh, we've seen that, and we have 
many, uh, no, two open source solutions at the moment, namely OpenBSD and OpenBTS. OpenBTS uh, provided service during Burning Man and OpenBSD was uh, tested at uh, HAR 2009 very successfully. I was a subscriber as well then. Uh, so this was one of the, oh, this is very dark. I think we should skip that. This was the BS11. Some of you may have seen that. That was one of the first things that was used uh, with OpenBTC. These are the IP um, access nano BTSs. So these are uh, somewhat pricey, 4,500. The OpenBTS was cheap but very heavy. So it had to lug around 48 kilograms for 250 euros. Here you have something that's just, I think, a kilo and that's 4,500. There's something in between um, that uh, I've used and uh, broken apparently. Um, so the price for this is approximately $1,250 plus a good clock. And this is like a software defined radio, the USRP. It's very versatile. You can not just do um, attack on GSM with it. We've also done DECT research with it. Um, you can also do our RFID sniffing with it and many other things. You can watch TV with it if you want to. Um, so yes, there is no layer one for GPRS, but um, it's a nice, look, OpenBTS is very, very easy to modify and um, that's why I chose it as a target. And like this is uh, easier to drag around than this BS11 and uh, cheaper than the IP access nano BTS. Now, um, the demo, I'll set this up. Common failures, um, I flag clock precision oftentimes because I used the stock clock initially, but also because I had um, a, I have a fuzzy one in this, like a, an external clock. It's somewhat imprecise though, even if you tune it, it drifts uh, within the length of this talk so that uh, like an iPhone 4 will not hook onto the base station. Um, but there are better solutions. For instance, there are a couple of Russian guys who produce a, something called the Clock Tamer. And I've used one of these uh, when I was in the US recently and they are very, very good. Like they give good stability. And um, I'm waiting for, for my module here. The other thing I often ran into was that I misinterpreted the stack traces because um, you, you basically overwrite too much. And the same thing is like, you, you can, it's easy to trigger the wrong bug because there may be more than one in a function. And uh, last but not least, I also overlooked sometimes that uh, code was placed on not an executable page. That's why I said it's useful to dump the MMU configuration before you get serious about this. We'll skip this and talk about the baseband apocalypse. So why I really care about this is because you can do really nasty shit. Um, I mean, consider you do this attack in a, in a crowded and or sensitive area, like in an airport lounge, uh, in a financial district uh, like Luxembourg, uh, near embassies, um, high volley targets again. Um, now, you, you have some more budget to spend on developing exploits, so you don't like this, this stupid auto answer thing that's like ridiculous. So you just record audio, compress it, and like, there's lots of RAM there. Uh, store it in RAM, piggyback onto the next data connection, and uh, just send it out because the baseband controls the microphone. The application CPU if you cannot disconnect the microphone usually. And in uh, lots of the newer chipsets, also the camera hangs off there. So you can have fun, uh, depending on who you are. And if you have a shared memory architecture, then you can compromise the application CPU as well, which is very bad, because then all of the, the, the hardening features that you've built into the operating system on the application CPU, they're basically useless, because um, the attacker just, just uses a different vector. Um, something I haven't done, because it's difficult to do legally is um, looked into ping pong games. If you have access to, um, to the base uh, transceiver stations that are used by uh, mobile operators as well, then you can probably find similar bugs in, in the software running there if you look long enough. And then you can just like compromise the cell phone and then you fingerprint the other side, like what, what, kind, of, um, what kind of BTS do I have? Then you compromise that and then you infect, infect more phones. 
this is like a two-year project, though, I think, if you have a, size, a team of like five to six people who are serious about this. Um, you can brick phones permanently. I've done that accidentally. Um, <laughs> two Nokia's died. Um, um, but, uh, yeah, I mean, you can do this intentionally. For me, it was unintentionally. And um, the other problem is there's no easy forensics possible here. Um, if you're smart, you make sure that you don't write anything to flash. It all stays in RAM, and at the next power off, everything's gone. And, I mean, the privacy problems were one thing, but you can also, I mean, of course, you can also do billing problems for the carrier by sending out SMSs or doing premium voice calls. And it doesn't have to happen that at the time that you compromise the phone. You just do it like a random time interval, like five to seven hours later, and it'll be somewhat tricky to fi figure out uh, what, uh, what was the original problem and uh, why all of these people suddenly send a, a premium text to, uh, to this uh, one number. And this is also something that gets you around uh, most of the fraud detection if you do many, many small uh, transactions. So it's a, an arms race. To do forensics, you need, um, you need uh, exploits again because they've disabled JTAG on most of the phones. So the scary bit is that at the moment, I don't really know how like, we can defend ourselves. I mean, we turn off, off, off all our cell phones. I don't think that's a solution. It's, it's like, with these things, it's kind of hard as well. How do you know that it's off? It's like a software animation that shows me the slider. Hell, I don't know. Could be on still. Um, so there's this funny story about uh, some German company that apparently sec produces secure end-to-end -end solutions for governments. And they have this... Uh, um, enclosure, the soundproof enclosure now for the phones because they only trust the headsets. Um, this tells you something about the potential problems that they have in the firmware of the phone that they're using. But um, there is, I think there still is hope for the paranoid, and uh, you probably have seen the talk um, by Harald, and I think this is a project that we should all support um, because um, if we have a, uh, an open source and or free software GSM baseband stack, then more people can actually look at the source code and will hopefully look at the source code of that and shake out security bugs. And um, Osmocom, as I gathered from uh, the information publicly available, uh, implements layer one to three. Correct me if this is wrong. Targets Calypso, and I think recently people have started working on MTK as well. And um, the Calypso chipsets that you can use are um, present in, in the OpenMoco and in the Motorola, the cheap Motorola phones. And the current functionality about GSM phase one from what I've seen, so you can send and receive SMS and you can uh, have voice calls. So let's talk about disclosure. Um, Qualcomm, I had, like, I had really strong feelings about disclosure initially, but Qualcomm has been fantastic. Uh, it was great working together. Um, Apple um, was a little bit slower, but they fixed the, this Timsy bug this week as well, and they will get more bugs to fix. Um, same for Qualcomm. Um, there was a vendor outreach program by Microsoft um, who basically contacted all of the baseband vendors, if I understand this process correctly. And uh, one interesting uh, remark I got from someone from Sony Ericsson, which, who ex S.T. Ericsson, who explicitly told me that he can publish this uh, email, so I par use parts of this email. Now, I, I'd like to, to do that because um, it shows that there's a certain disconnect between uh, people um, who, uh, who, who do this engineering and the, the people who, um, who do um, vulnerability um, development. So he thinks that stack canaries that are checked in the scheduler uh, prevent problems with stack overflows. Um, not quite. Uh, this helps if, you, if your engineering uh, department shoots itself in the foot with, a stack, with an accidental stack overflow. It doesn't help against an attacker who, who does this maliciously. And uh, using Coverity on the real-time operating system, um, well, yeah, they might have done that, but they still found bugs there. So. And, and plenty of them. So it, I think there's, like, there's a, a need to educate the engineers uh, who develop these, not just cell phones, but embedded uh, systems, uh, software in general, 
to, to be care more careful and take security into account as well. And the outlook is that we will see the same problems again for um, UMTS, for GPP, and uh, you say, well, okay, so 3GPP uses mutual authentication, so it will only be the very well-funded uh, adversaries who can get past that, who can do all of these attacks, but it turns out that this is humongous radio resource control layer, which is like 1,800 uh, pages of specification um, encoded in ASN1 PER, and there's only one single vendor that I've seen in terms of parses in the baseband stack. And um, I think within the next one or two years, we'll see femtocells as very cheap attack platforms. Thankfully, the LTE specification that is used pre, like the, the part that is pre-authentication is simpler than 3GPP, so there may still be hope there. But um, for now, I mean, if we have to live with, uh, with, uh, with 3GPP at the moment, like this attack platform costs 40 to, 50, uh, 40 to 60 um, pounds on, on e uh, eBay, Great Britain. And there's still a significant amount of work to repurpose it, but I think it's, it's possible. And uh, with this, I'd like to finish. So memory corruptions over the air interface are possible even with, with cheap hardware, cheap, well, okay, below $2,000. Uh, vulnerability, I mean, it's like, it's a price of a halfway decent laptop, right? So um, you shouldn't discount that. Um, vulnerabilities in the, the GSM baseband code bases are plentiful at the moment. I'll hope that'll change. Um, it's, it plays into the hand of the attackers that there's only a s relatively small number of baseband vendors. And, uh, well, if you have malicious code execution on the baseband CPU, then you can do a lot of really funny things. And if you have this shared memory design, you can compromise security completely. So that's, that's been it for the non-demo part. I'd like to thank uh, the University of Luxembourg for supporting me. I'd like to very much thank the anonymous engineer uh, for bringing my attention to this. And uh, I think it was, yeah, Jake, Jake Applebaum was the one who brought me in contact with him. Synamics basically sponsored the tools for this. Um, Harald Welte helped me out technically a couple of times. Um, Silva, Silva has been very great today uh, with the, the, the used RP that failed. Um, Andre Stempe helped me with, uh, with soldering things uh, back in Luxembourg. And Carson Noll and, uh, and Tyler Letter great, um, thankfully provided me, uh, well, no, sorry. I'm thankful for them providing me uh, with replacement gear because of my failed USRP. And of course, Kessel uh, for writing um, OpenBTS and Qualcomm and Apple, last but not least, for fixing all these bugs. And uh, I'm, I'm really serious about this. Thank you, because um, there are other industries I've seen recently in embedded systems where people care a little bit less, so. Uh.